stand to your feet today, and uh, I'm going to read out of Isaiah chapter 54. Father, we just thank you today for your word, and we ask that you would speak to us. We approach your word humbly, knowing that it is a living and an active thing, Lord, and Father, it is ultimately the thing that determines where we spend eternity, and so we approach it humbly, Lord, knowing that it is the truth. Isaiah 54, 1 to 3 says, Sing, O barren, you who have not born, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not labored with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left. And your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. You may be seated. How many of you know God wants to make the desolate cities inhabited? Amen. So the title of the message today is how large is your heart? Amen. How large is your heart? Because verse 2 says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. You know, the Bible says to enlarge your hearts. I mean, what a glorious promise that is. Because it calls us to grow and to expand. It, it, you know, I believe it calls us to dream big. To take bold steps of faith. Because a lost and a broken world lies at our doorstep. Amen. You know, and it's a world I believe that we're called to change. But it will take more than simply rules and lifeless religious rituals. Because the reality is they have them already. Amen. And it's not working. You see, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8 says, love never fails. Amen. You know, God wants to unleash the power of his love on this world. And, and this is why I believe we have a key part to play in this. Mark 16 verse 15, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And, and you know what? His command has not changed, irrespective of the environment, irrespective of viruses or plagues or pestilences, irrespective of what the enemy is trying to do, Jesus said, go. And because of that, we must understand God has called us to enlarge our area of influence, both as individuals and as a church. But before we can enlarge our tents, we first have to enlarge our hearts. This is why Psalm 119, 31, 32 says, I have stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord. Put me not to shame. I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. You see, it's not enough to enlarge your vision. You must also enlarge your heart. Amen? Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 Jesus here is talking, and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. You see, God wants to enlarge our hearts. He wants us to feel what he feels to see as he sees, to love as he loves, to heal and to, to touch broken multitudes that surround us. You know, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7, when God appeared to Moses and the Lord says, I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. You know that word know in the Hebrew is yada, which means to know, to feel, or to be acquainted with. Amen. So you, you could say that God is personally acquainted with our pain. He, it says, I know their sorrows. Amen. It didn't mean from a distance. It literally meant he felt what they felt. You know, God hears their cry, even if we as the church at times don't. The cry of the broken, the cry of the addict, the, the, you know, the cry of the, the lonely. The cry of the orphan, the cry of the widow, the cry of the, uh, of the single mother. You know, God hears their cry. And this is why he wants us to speak boldly, to love deeply, and to give generously. 
as we reach out to hurting people with his words of life. Matthew 9 and verse 35, it says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved to compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest. Send out laborers into his harvest. You see God wants us to see people as he sees them. And to love people as he loves them. You know John 3.16 says God so loved the world. 1 John 4.8 says God is love. 1 John 4.16 again God is love. Amen. And it's important to understand that, that God is love. And if we want to be like him, then we must love people too. Amen. We must love people the way he loves them. Acts 5.20, go into the temple and give the people this message of life. Because let me say this, there is a cost and an inconvenience involved with taking this message of life to the world. You know, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, again, Jesus said, that if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Amen. Matthew 16 and verse 24. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. That's not a popular message in today's world. You know, because we are a very selfish generation. We're very self-centered. But Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. Amen. And he said, take up your cross and follow me. And so, therefore, that involves laying aside our agendas our plans, and our preferences so that we can obey the king. Amen? Uh, and, and again, l l like I said, that begins even on a Sunday morning. I mean, how many people prefer to just stay in bed? I've had people say, well, Sunday's my only day off. Well, let me say, the devil doesn't take a day off. He's plotting your destruction and your family's destruction morning, noon, and night. And you know what? He's not playing games even if you are. Amen. But you know what? You're here today. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. Thank you, Lord. But you see, God wants to fill our hearts with compassion for others. But in order to do that, we must become open-hearted givers who allow him to enlarge our hearts. So again, God today wants you to enlarge your heart. He will do it if you allow him to. And this is why we must become a people who do not look at the price tag. Because we all say we want revival, but too many times we look at the price tag and we walk away. Because let me say this, if the flu virus can keep some of us from church, what would happen if we were to fail, face some real actual persecution? Where, you know, that many Christians face around the world. You know, you have to ask yourself the question. If something as simple as a, as a flu virus, oh, it's not just the flu virus, Pastor John. It's the end of the world. No, it's not. No, it's not. The world's not going to end through this, okay? So get over it. Do you believe the word of God or not? I mean, some of you have been quoting Psalm 91 since forever, and now you have a reason to actually believe it. Come on. Hallelujah. This is simply an opportunity for you to put your faith into action and act like the word of God is so. How many of you believe the word of God is so? Well, the Bible says no plague will come near your dwelling in Jesus' name. It says no weapon formed against you will prosper. How many of you are claiming those promises? How many of you have been pleading the blood since you heard last Sunday? Amen. Plead the power of the blood over your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. If you could turn into Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. And we have the parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke 10 and verse 25. And a certain Lord stood up testing him and said, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And, and this was a very intelligent man because right there... Um, he, he understood that Jesus had essentially signed a blank check and he was a little uncomfortable so he wanted to clarify what Jesus meant by loving your neighbor as yourself and, uh, and he said uh, then he said to him um, <clears throat> uh, you've answered rightly do this and uh, 
and you will live. But he wanting to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Uh, it says wanting to justify himself. I would say wanting to excuse himself because Jesus had just, you know, by confirming that loving your neighbor is yourself. And he wanted, said, who is my neighbor? And uh, Jesus answered and said to him, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing. It says they wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he um, journeyed, uh, the same where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Um, Again, God doesn't consider us having, you know, we think we have compassion because we put a sad face on Facebook about something. We think we have compassion because we put a a flag saying, pray for, uh, but you know, God doesn't look on that as compassion. We, We do that not for others, we do that for ourselves to keep, appease our own conscience. But the Bible here shows that you don't have compassion until you actually do something. Compassion is a verb, it's an action. And God wants to move us as the church to action. Amen. And so it says he had compassion on him. And um, and it says. And so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine and set him on his own animal, brought him to his to the inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more uh, you spend, uh, when I come back, I will repay you. So he essentially signed a blank check and he said, whatever the costs are, I will cover it. And, um, and which of these do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, the one who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. And, and this is the thing about the Good Samaritan. You know, the Good Samaritan wasn't unusual in that he saw the need. What made this man exceptional was he actually did something about it. Okay? Um, and, and I think this is important for us to see this. You know, he did what he could. Just like the story in Mark chapter 14 with the woman with the alabaster box. She broke the alabaster box, poured it on Jesus, preparing him for burial. They were giving out to, to the woman. And Jesus said, let this woman alone. Um, she has done what she could. She has done what she could. And wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. And so she did what she, has, what she could, but have, have we done what we could? And, and you see, this is what we need to see. Jesus said he, she has done what she could. And, and like the woman with the alabaster box, it cost the good Samaritan personally to help. It cost them time, money, comfort, and safety. Because it was a big risk that he took to stop and help. Because, you know, in the time of Christ, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was so notoriously dangerous, it became known as the way of blood. Because so much innocent blood was shed there by robbers. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. describes this very same road in his famous speech, I've been to the mountaintop, which incidentally was given only one day before he was murdered on April the 4th, 1964. So I think it's, it's fascinating that a man of such caliber and a man so powerfully used by God and a man who stands head and shoulders above, you know, so many others in history that his final sermon, so to speak, because he was a Baptist preacher, and, um, but his final sermon was, you know, it, it's at least touched on the Good Samaritan. And, 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 you know, the ramifications of that for us. Okay. And so, um, anyway, let me read this quote by him. And it says, as soon as we got to the road, and um, this is the road to Jericho. Uh, this is Martin Luther King Jr. He said, I said to my wife, I can see why Jesus used this as a setting for his parable. It's a winding, meandering road. And in the days of Jesus, it became to be known as the bloody pass. And you know, it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over the man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. Or if it's possible that they felt that the man on the ground was merely faking and he was acting like he'd been robbed and hurt in order to seize them over there and lure them for a quick and easy seizure. And so the first question that the priest asked and the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? 
And I think that was such a profound quote and such a profound question because they asked the question, the natural question that all of us ask, you know, when you're going down a dark street and you see somebody, um, you know, your, your first question is, if I, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? And so, uh, you know, this is the thing, that the priest and the Levite, they saw the need and the need asked them the question, how big is your heart? How big is your heart? Uh, but they ask the question, what will happen to me? And in the same way, you may ask yourself today, what if the coronavirus takes hold? Have I made adequate provision for myself and my family? Do I have gold and, and silver stored up? Do I have bitcoins and rice in, in my house? You know, should I, ma- should I stock up? Should I make provision for the months ahead? You know what? I'm going to put my life savings into pasta, pot noodles, toilet paper, and bottled water. And, you know, maybe some of you have seen those videos online of people fighting over, you know, having big bundles of toilet paper in their thing and fighting over it. And I, I think it's a sad indication of where they're at. But anyway, you know, the truth is this. While you may easily make provision for the months ahead, there are many who have no provision for today. Not a mind tomorrow. Okay, or next week. You know, you're anxious and worried about something that might never happen. But while there are others who are going to bed hungry tonight, and we must not ignore their cry. You know, both the priest and the Levite asked, if I stop, what will happen to me? The Samaritan asked, if I don't stop, what will happen to him? It's, it's, it's about a different perspective because just like the Good Samaritan, and again, the Good Samaritan was an oxymoron to the Jewish people at that time because to them there was no such thing as a Good Samaritan. They were all bad. But Jesus, you know, uh, I, I guess wanted to cause them to think. But, you know, just like with the Good Samaritan, you know what? Living with a large heart involves risk and it involves sacrifice. So again, the question is, what perspective are you going to take in your life? You know, what will you focus on? Will you focus on yourself or will you focus on others? Because Jesus said, go. He didn't say stay. He didn't stay, be comfortable. He said, go into all the world. You know, are you going to focus on what you can get or on what you can give? You know, will you focus on, on the sacrifice or will you focus on the soul? Because you can't do both. You know, it's easy to say, Lord, I love you. But Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And you know, John 14, 15. And surely his cardinal commandment was to love each other. Amen. As, as I have loved you, John 13, 34. You know, his cardinal commandment was do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Luke, uh, Luke 6 and verse 31. And this brings me to the crux of, of this message. You know, I was finished preaching in Brazil. I had such a wonderful time. I preached to so many people. It was so wonderful to see people answering the altar calls. So many young people, you know, receiving the, the, the fire of God. Because I didn't just go to, to get fire in Brazil. I came to bring fire to Brazil. In Jesus' name, amen. And um, anyway, I, I was finished preaching. I preached five times in three days. My voice was gone. I'd only barely a squeak left in my voice. I was exhausted. And so I was going with Eduardo and Talison and their family to the beach for a couple of days before I, fly, before I flew home. I was going to go straight home, but they insisted, you can't come to Brazil and not go to the beach. So I said, okay, you know what, let's do this. And... Um, it's funny, before I left, Joanna said, you know, they're going to be laughing at you at the beach. She wanted to put fake tan on me before I left. I said, you know what, that's going to look even more ridiculous than me looking so white and shiny. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny, uh, at the church, there was a professional photographer, and he wanted to take a couple of photos of me. And so he took me up, and uh, he had all the lights and all this stuff, and um, he wanted to take a... a just wanted to bless him with a couple of photos. And, and Tallison was there. And he was fiddling with his camera and fiddling with the light. And he just kept changing everything. And eventually he turned to Tallison and said something in Portuguese. Tallison started laughing. He said, he said the, the photographer said, he said, man, this guy's just too white. Anything I do, he's just, he's just too white. So anyway, praise the Lord. Um, so we were taking this bus ride to, um, uh, you know, to the beach, which was about an eight-hour journey. And um, so uh, we'd been driving about seven hours. And I just finished um, last week's message on the blood. And um, I just put some finishing touches to the message. And, um, and so I was, I was very, very tired. And we, were about, we weren't too far away from where we were going to. And um, 
like I said, I had no voice. I was just exhausted. And, and so I was, I, was, uh, I, I was, I guess I was being quiet, which is good. Um, and suddenly God began to speak to me because I just started to read the Bible, just, you know, not relating to the message, just to read the Bible for the Bible. And um, suddenly God began to speak. Now, again, this shouldn't be a surprise to any of us because, you know, uh, the book of Isaiah 52 says, I am he who speaks. Uh, in that day, my people will know that it is I, that I am he who speaks. So we serve a God who speaks. And um, it's not so much that God isn't speaking to us. It's just the times we're not always listening. And, um, but sometimes when you get so weary and so tired, how many of you know that sometimes it's at your lowest point that God speaks to you? Because you've run out of energy and you've tried everything. And so eventually you just get to the point where you become quiet. And it's amazing when you become quiet that God will speak to you. Amen. Can anybody... Nobody can, okay. okay, well, maybe that's just the way I am, okay? But um, anyway, uh, God started speaking, because I had an amazing time in Brazil, you know, beautiful, warm people. I mean, I, 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 everybody was hugging. <laughs> it was funny. And, um, the, uh, you know, wonderful churches, you know, stunning beaches, beautiful scenery, but I also saw great need. You know, I, I, I saw people who in some instance, instances seemed to be utterly destitute. And, um, you know, it was heartbreaking because I, I was embarrassed because I'd never really realized how blessed we are in Ireland. And, and sometimes it's, it's, if you haven't been outside these shores much, you know, you don't realize a lot of the things that we take for granted. Um, not everybody in the world uh, has that. And so I was reading Luke chapter 9. And I'm going to read it here because it's very powerful. And I, I don't know how many times I've read this before, but I'd never seen this. Luke chapter 9 and verse 10. And it says, and the apostles, when they had returned, told him all they had done. And then he went aside privately to desert a place belonging to a city called Bethsaida. Uh, but when the multitude saw it, they followed him. And he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And he healed those who had need of healing. And when the day began, uh, and, and, and it's interesting to note how always Jesus met the people, the needs of the people where they were at. Amen. And when the day began to wear away, um, the twelve came and said to him, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we're in a deserted place here. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And he said, we've no more than five loaves and two fishes unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there are about 5,000 men. And then he said to the disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. And he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples and they gave to the multitude. Then they all ate and were filled, and 12 baskets of the leftover fragrance were taken over, taken up by them. And so this is the thing. The disciples said, look, Lord, all these people are here. They're hungry. Um, uh, you need to send them away. Um, because this is the thing. Sometimes when you see great need, it's far easier to either pretend that it doesn't exist or else just harden your heart and ignore it. And, and this is why the disciples said, just send them away. They had a problem, and they just wanted to push the problem away. The people were hungry. But Jesus responded by saying, you give them something to eat. You see, Christ had a big heart, and he couldn't ignore their plight. And he refused to look the other way. You know, he genuinely cared about people. In Mark 15, he said about the people, the multitudes, you know, yeah, don't, I don't want to send them away. They've been here for three days without eating. And they might faint on the way. So, you know, Jesus cared about people. And I think it's important for us to always remember that fact, you know, that it's, it's, it's about people. It's about loving people in his name. And so in this short little, um, you, you know, few paragraphs, he, he, he revealed three essential keys to experiencing the miraculous provision of God in our lives. And I'd like to share them very quickly today. And the first one is this. Break it down. The first thing Jesus did was he had a big problem. There was about 5,000 men. So he assumed there was somewhere between 20 and 30,000 people if you include women and children. But Jesus broke it down. He didn't, you know, look at them as, as a mass of people. He broke them into groups of 50. Now, why did he do that? I believe there's, there's a principle here. You know, uh, he, he, the first key is break it down. Mark 9.23 says, if you can believe, all things are possible to those who believe. The question when asked today, is how big is possible how big is possible because the bible says in mark matthew 19 with god all things are possible 
You know, I look at the mountains and I'm reminded that we serve a big God. Fact is, I remember as a kid, you know, a 14-year-old kid going up the mountains around Kerry during the winter and the snow. And I remember standing up there as, as an unbeliever and looking around at this beautiful panorama uh, uh, of the Kerry Mountains and the snow and the lakes and saying to myself, there has to be a God. This didn't just happen. You know, you know, the, the Bible says, you know, even, even the, the creation is proclaiming, you know, the message that there is a God. You know, you, you have to be an idiot to look at the beauty of God's creation and think it just happened. There was a bang and, you know, one blob fell into another blob and suddenly it all just, way. Hey, there you go. That's idiotic. You know, you need, you need more faith to believe in evolution than you do in a God who created this. Okay. But anyway. You know, we, we look at creation, we remind we serve a big God. And needs that may seem big to us are not big to Him. Christ took a big problem, the feeding of a multitude of people, possibly 30,000 people, like I said, and He broke it down. You know, because again, that's, that's something like, you know, almost like a football stadium. But anyway, if you think of the logistics involved, you know, this was a huge undertaking. You know, even if you had a large professional catering team with weeks of preparation... But Christ was in a wilderness, you know, with neither food nor facilities to hand. And so, you know, there was a tremendous need. But he, he broke it down. He took a big problem and broke it into smaller pieces. That's exactly what I did when I was in Bolton Street College studying mechanics. You know, we broke down the car into the various, you know, the transmission system, the steering, suspension, engine electrical system and then within every system you broke those down into the various parts and then you got the parts and you had the exploded view of every little thing down to every little nut and bolt you know in that part and and so this this is how we, we you know we got to understand and in the same way Jesus broke it down into groups of 50 you know how, how do you feed 20 or 30 thousand people your mind goes blank but you know what if you break it down into groups of 50 of feeding groups of 50, you know, that's a little easier. It's a bit like the saying, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Because, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes we don't do anything because we can't do everything. Because, you know, we look at the need of the world and the world that surrounds us, it can be overwhelming. But that's the problem. Sometimes we don't do anything just because we can't do everything. You know, I remember our first house in Kildare, um, when it was being built, we wanted to get upstairs to see um, you know, how the building was progressing. But, you know, it was very difficult. It was um, dirty and it was dangerous because, uh, you know, we had to get on this ladder and it was shaky and we're trying to reach up to see what the upstairs um, was looking like. But, you know what, we came back a, a, a few weeks later and it was so easy to go upstairs. You know what made the difference? They put in a stairway. And... You know, whereas the week before, um, you know, there was a ladder upstairs, but I had to try and jump up to the, to the first floor and then get the ladder down and bring Joanna up. And, and the floor was all dirty and it was, but, but you know what? The thing is, it wasn't one big jump. It was lots of small steps um, that brought you uh, upstairs. And um, it took you to the top. And in the same way, sometimes we try to make one big leap from where we are to where we believe God wants us to be. And that's the problem, you know, because th th this is where you need to learn to trust God. Because um, you don't have to see the whole staircase, just the next step. And sometimes it's just a little step, like just getting involved, serving somewhere in the church. You know, sometimes it's, it's, we miss, you know, uh, uh, you know, God because we're looking for the big thing. Remember the servant of Naaman said, if he'd asked you to do a little thing, would you not have done it? So many people miss God because they're looking for the big door, the big opportunity, the big, you know, and, and they're, not, they're not big enough to do a small thing. You have to be big enough to do a small thing well and with a humble heart. Despise not the day of small beginnings, the book of Zechariah says. 1998, I went to Bible school, sold my sports car, and um, I finally have a nice car again. It took me 20 years, but you know what? I'm finally driving a car I like again. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Amen. Uh, <laughs> but I left Bible school, uh, to go to Bible school, came back in 99, got married to the love of my life, Joanna, uh, my first wife, my only wife. Hallelujah. <laughs> And um, we were believing to go into ministry. And, um, you know, but the first thing I did was get a job. 
because, you know, I struggle to relate to people who are in full-time ministry, but they have no ministry or fruit to speak of. And so, you know, they're floating around all day doing nothing in the name of the Lord. And I, I, I just don't believe that's the way God, God is. You know, you don't go into full-time ministry until you have a full-time ministry that demands you, you, you're full-time, okay? There's, there's nothing unspiritual about working, Okay? You know, the Bible says that that's a really pathetic clapping. Some of you obviously hate your job. But, y- you know, the Bible says if a man will not work, neither will he eat. So there's a principle there, you know. We should be working for the Lord. Okay, but anyway, um, we started working as youth pastors. It, it, it wasn't, to be honest, what we had dreamed of. But we decided to serve God where we were as opposed to where we wanted to be. Okay, today we're, we're where we want to be and we're grateful for that. But you know what, we, we started All Nations in 07. And, um, but you know what, it was late 2019 before I went into full-time ministry. It, it certainly took longer than I had hoped, um, but it was a 20-year process. But you know what, that's okay because the process prepares you for the promise. You know, Joseph was 17 when he had a dream. He was 30 when he was put in as ruler over Egypt under Pharaoh. You know, David was anointed to be king somewhere between the age of 10 and 15. He wasn't 30 until he stepped in and was crowned as, as king. So again, you know what, there is, there is a process. You know, the pastor in Brazil remarked after I preached, he was very surprised by how the fact that he could understand every single word I spoke because he'd heard the Irish accents quite strong. But he, he was amazed that he could understand everything I said. Well, I said, that's easy. I spent the best part of 20 years on the phone to non-national people trying to explain about their car. And it's, it's not easy. You had to learn to speak clearly if you wanted people to understand you, you know, because some Polish guys moved here two weeks ago. He's got like five words and you have to explain a quite a complicated process to him and so um you know so I had to learn to to speak clearly and so this is the thing you know God works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform you know there, there is a preparation process and this is why some people never step into their dream is they're not willing to undergo the process so the first thing break it down if you have a big problem break it down into small parts the second one that Jesus did Lift it up. He lifted up the, the little that he had to God and he asked for God's blessing. Because how many of you know you can do a lot more with something small that has God's blessing than something big that doesn't? Amen? Amen? Thank you, Jesus. The first thing he did was break it down. The second thing he did was lift it up. Because your problem may be great, but his provision is greater. Psalm 121 says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You need to know where your help is coming from. It's it's coming from the Lord. And this is why it's important to understand that. Because you know, Genesis chapter 22 verse 14. God revealed himself to Abraham as Jehovah Jireh. You know, uh, you know, God is El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. And this is why for the life of me, I do not understand why so many ministers take delight in misrepresenting God as the God of barely enough. He is not the God of barely, he's the God of more than enough. You know, and, and so many times in the church, we have this barely enough thinking. Oh God, just give me barely enough to pay the bills. Give me barely enough to get through the week. That's not the way God wants you to go through life. Amen. He wants you to have more than enough. Because when you have more than enough, when you are blessed, you can be a blessing. Amen. You can't be a blessing until you are blessed. Hallelujah. If you don't want the blessing, I'll take it in Jesus' name. So no matter what your need is, know that God is more than enough. Just learn to lift it up. Lift it up in prayer to the one who hears you when you cry. Isaiah chapter, uh, sorry, Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Amen. So again, lead me to the rock. Jesus is our rock. You know, 1 Timothy 2, 8 says, you know, God is, um, <coughs> it says, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. You see, God is looking for men and women who will pray, who will lift up holy hands to God and who will take their place in prayer. You know, the book of Habakkuk talks about, I will stand on my watch. You know, we need men and women who are standing on their watch in prayer. 
Ezekiel 22, so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and who would stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. We have to stand in the gap for our generation. I'm going to be touching on that next week. You know, I believe God wants to bring a great revival to Europe in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. But we're going to have to take our place in prayer. We're going to have to stand in the gap. Amen. Uh, Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and, supp- and supplication, with thanksgiving, presents your requests to God. You know, I don't believe that this promise simply relates to our own needs, but also the needs of others. You know, like Christ, we can present the needs of the needy multitudes that surround us to our Heavenly Father. And He will bless and He will multiply the bread of life in our hands. You know, Luke 9, 16 says, Christ lifted the needs of the multitude before God in prayer, and God worked a miracle. I wonder what miracles would God do among us if only we would learn to pray. You know, clearly what they had wasn't enough to meet the need. I mean, and sometimes, like I said, in the face of great need, we can feel overwhelmed. We can be tempted to say, well, what's the use? It's, it's a waste of time. You know, the danger is that we don't even try to help uh, because the needs are so overwhelming. And, you know, this is the thing. When you see the size of the favelas, I drove past them and they just looked huge. And, you know, the needs over there are huge. Like I said, they're beautiful people and there's, you know, there's a contrast. You have areas of great wealth and then areas of great poverty. And, you know, when you see the needy multitudes that live in them, like I said, you can be tempted to think, what difference can you make? It's like the story of a little boy who was out walking with his grandfather one morning and the tide was going out and had left thousands of starfish all along the beach you know, for miles, and the little boy started picking up starfish and throwing them to the water, and his grandfather said, what are you doing? He said, uh, you know, what dif- you know uh, why, why are you doing that? What difference can you make? Because there was obviously thousands of others that he could never reach, and he said, you know, what difference can you make? And, and he says, it made a difference to this one, and he threw it into the water. And, and I think this is the attitude we have to take as the church. You know, we can't help everyone, but we can certainly help someone. Okay? And, and, and so, Second Chronicles 7, If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Turn from their wicked ways. Then I will heal their land. If we will pray, God will meet our needs. And you know what? If we will pray, God will move the mountains. If we will pray, God will, will feed the multitudes. If we will pray, God will heal our land. Amen. So we must learn to not magnify our needs, but rather magnify the Lord. Jesus didn't magnify the size of the need. He magnified the Lord by lifting it up in prayer. Amen. We must lift our need up to the one who can answer those needs. You know, Psalm 30 says, I cried out to the Lord and he healed me. Last weekend, I went into the matter. Sinead was there. The doctors said, you know, that she might only have hours to live. But you know what? We declared life. And guess what? Sinead is here again today in Jesus' name. (laughs) Hallelujah. No doctor gets the final say on your life. We bless the doctors. We love them. But we understand that when they come to the end of themselves, there is still someone to whom we can turn to. I cried out to the Lord and he healed me. You must learn how to cry out to God, not just for your needs, but the needs of this generation in Jesus' name. I'm not happy by standing by and watching a whole generation die and go to a Christless eternity. God wants to wake us up as the church and learn how to pray again. Learn how to cry out to Him. Learn how to present the needs of our generation. Because the governments don't have the answers. Our generation is becoming increasingly confused and polarized and divided. And, you know, people are destroying themselves. But, you know, as the church, we have the answer. Jesus is still the way, the truth, and the light. He is the way in Jesus' name. Let's lift him up. He said, if I be lifted up from this earth, I will draw all men unto me. We must lift him up as the answer. So I love those Christians in the middle of these infected areas. Instead of hiding away, the Christians are on the streets preaching the gospel. You see, we must do three things. Firstly, Jesus showed us, break it down. Secondly, lift it up. And lastly, give it out. He gave it to the disciples to give out. Because what Christ handed to the disciples, they in turn handed to the hungry multitudes. 
You know what? Their cooperation was an essential part of the miracle. You know, why didn't God cause the bread to fall inside every group of 50? Well, to every miracle, there is God's part and there's our part. For some reason, God in his love decides to include us in what he does. There's our part, there's God's part. Amen? And let me say this, don't expect God to do what you can do already. I've seen God do wonderful healings and wonderful miracles, but I will never, you know, I will never pray and believe for God to shave me. You know why? I'll never ask him to do my hair on a Sunday morning. I can do it myself. It's nice, isn't it? Listen, I'm 46. I'm grateful I got here. Thank you, Jesus. When I was a teenager, I said, Lord, I don't want my hair to go gray. I don't want to lose my hair. I don't want to lose my teeth. And I don't want glasses in Jesus' name. So, hallelujah. 27 years later, I'm still holding out in Jesus' name. <laughs> but don't expect God to do what you can do for yourself. Listen, the disciples couldn't multiply bread. But they had hands. They learned from the beginning that what Christ gave to them was to be passed on to others. And in the same way, you know what? We have been given much, maybe more than any generation has gone before us in terms of opportunity, technology, revelation, and resources. I mean, I remember back when you used to have to send off to buy a book or whatever. Now you can go on YouTube and listen to as many preachers as you want, you know. Not all of it's good, but it's all out there. You know, compare yourself to your grandmother. You know, and, and, and you, you, know, you might feel you might don't have as much as somebody else, but if you compare yourself to your grandmother, you'll discover you have far more than any of their generation had. You know, it's not that long since our, our ancestors were going down to the river to wash their clothes. You just pop it in the machine, press a button, and off you go. I'm just saying, we take a lot for granted. But to whom much is given, much is expected, Luke 12, 48. When someone has been given much... Much will be required in return. When someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. And so, have we been guilty of holding on to that which needs to be given out? Because let me say this, within two days of the Notre Dame fire in Paris, almost a billion dollars was raised um, for a building. And, um, but, but you know what, in light of the fact that somewhere in region, nine people, nine million people a year die of starvation... When, you know, approximately every 10 seconds a, di a child dies from hunger or malnutrition, you have to ask yourself, do we have misplaced values? Because Jesus didn't care about buildings, he cared about people. How large is your heart? And that is the title of the message today, how large is your heart? Jesus said in Luke 7 and verse 18, one of the signs of his coming is the poor have the gospel preached to them. You see, as Christians, we're called to minister to the least of these. God loves the poor, and he's called us to take the good news of the gospel to them. You know, in Matthew 25, Jesus said, In so much as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. He said, You came, you visited me, and in, 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 I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, you visited me. And um, the, it, it, let me just read it very quickly. I'm just about finished, but... I, I think this is important because it does tie, tie it all together. And, um, and the king will say to those in his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, and hurt the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous say, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When do we see you stranger and take you in, or uh, naked and clothe you? Or when do we see you sick or in prison and, and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, in so much as you've done it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And so remember that what we do to others, you know, in Jesus' eyes, we're doing to him. And so this doesn't just apply, I believe, to those who are in prison for crimes. And, and we, we're called, I believe we, we need to minister to those who are in prison. But it's also those who are imprisoned, you know, by poverty, by ignorance, by death, by, by lack of opportunity. Can you imagine in, in parts of the world there are children who are born into debt, you know, debt that their fathers had and they're born into slavery as a consequence of that. You know, there's, you know, there's people, like I said, born into, into 
poverty. They have no chance of getting out of that situation. And, you know, listen, the Dead Sea is dead because there's all these rivers that are coming into it, but nothing goes out. You know, all of us have been blessed by God, but we're blessed to be a blessing. You know, let me say this. Only, only approximately 150 years ago, over a million people in this nation died of starvation. And millions of others left the shores of this nation never to return again. And yet, since that time, we have been tremendously blessed as a nation, particularly through American multinationals coming in and, and, and giving good jobs in IT and etc. But you know, I believe we're obligated you know, in view of the fact that many of us earn more in one day than many other people around the world earn in a month, I believe we're ob obligated to, to help. We're obligated because, you know, God has blessed us to, to bless others. You know, Luke 12, I won't go there, but it talks about the man who said, you know, God blessed him. And it says, I will build barns and, uh, you know, I'm going to take rest. And God said, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And so too shall God deal with those who, um, you know, who are not rich towards God. And, you know, but God said, fool, this, I'm going to read it. And it says, a parable, a rich man, um, the ground of a certain man, um, yielded plentifully and that pretty much describes any of us that are in the western world um, you know and, and he taught within himself saying what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops and so he said I will do this I will build my barns and uh, build greater and there I will store my crops and my goods and I will say to my soul soul you have many goods laid up for many years take your ease drink and be merry but he answered fool this night your soul be required of you then whose will those, those things be for which you've provided so is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God it's interesting if you read this the amount of times he talks about himself and you know that describes our selfish generation me 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 you know some people uh, I find it tiresome talking to them because they're always talking about their favorite subject themselves and um this is how God sees selfishness. This short story shows in vivid detail, you know, the peril of living a selfish, self-centered life. We must remember in the light of eternity, so much of what we value is irrelevant. And so I don't know about you, but I don't want my life to be a parable of selfishness and greed. In eternity, I want to hear, well done, okay, good and faithful servant. Because, you know, I've heard some ministers say the poor are bad ground. And, you know, I have to ask myself, is it that they prefer, you know, that, that you sow into their jet, uh, that they think that's better ground? And, you know, I don't have a problem with a minister having a private jet, and I'm probably offending both sides of the argument on that. I don't, you know, if they're traveling the world to preach the gospel, but I don't think it's something to, to boast about. And it's not so, certainly not something that's to take priority over helping poor people. We're called to help people. We're called to love people. And so this is the crux, of, I guess, of what I was trying to say is what God spoke to my heart is, you know, we have people from our church who've gone back to Brazil and they're very eager to help. And so we're, we're going to start a, a legal entity over there. And, um, you know, we're going to take up an offering in a month's time. Uh, I'm believing to raise 50,000 euros. We're going to send it there and we're going to... Um, we're already planning in terms of what we can do in terms of educating these kids in the favelas, you know, blessing them, you know, with, with clothes and, and, and with food and, you know, blessing some orphans, you know, with some toys and just showing them the love of, of Jesus. And, um, you know, the pastor I was talking to in the summer, they're going to the, the northwest of Brazil where it's very poor. That's where many of the African slaves settled, you know, because Brazil once had slavery. But it's extremely poor. Many of the people don't even have running water. And so they're going to dig some wells. That's what they do. And when they dig a well, they start a church. And so each well costs about 5000 So I'd like us out of the money to maybe pay for three or four wells. And, you know, play a part in giving these people clean water and showing them the love of Jesus. Because sometimes our problem is, is we're so busy trying to tell people about Jesus, we're not demonstrating Jesus. And so that that is... What's on my heart? We're, we're going to do it in a month's time. Listen, we can't help everybody, but we can help somebody. You know, it was Bob Marley said this. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. Mother Teresa said this. If you can't feed 100 people, then you can feed one. You know, as a church, we have an opportunity to help some people in Brazil. Jesus broke it down into groups of 50, and that's why I have that figure in my heart, and I, I believe in to raise it. It's not impossible. You know, if 100 of us give, you know, 500 there, that's the figure. I mean, it's not a, it's not a big deal. I mean, I've already, I, I'll be honest, I gave two, the, 
you know, the two offerings I, 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 I got, I left them there in Brazil to put into the account to start it. And, um, you know, so we have seed in Brazil. I didn't just sow the word. We also sowed finance. And, um, you see, I, I believe we're called to minister to people, spirit, soul, and body. And, you know, if, if anything with this whole coronavirus, I, I believe it's showing us, you know, the shallowness and the self-centeredness that has gripped our society. And we need to come back to biblical values. We need to come back to, to loving our neighbor. And, and Jesus, when the, when, the, you know, when the lawyer wanted to clarify, who is my neighbor? Jesus drew a circle that is so big, it encircled the world. It didn't just do his neighborhood. It didn't just do his ethnic group. It didn't just do his nationality. Jesus drew a circle that included the world. And that's why the Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You know, James 2 says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? I understand we're already giving money to the Amazon and to other works around the world. But you know what? We're going to go to these favelas. It's a big problem. People living and dying in poverty without opportunity, without so much. But you know what? I believe we can make a change. You might be sitting there and say, well, why not my country? Well, you know what? We're going to start in Brazil. And, you know, God, I believe, is going to open the door to other countries to minister there as well. But you know what? Like I said, sometimes the need is so great, you're tempted to not do anything. But you know what? We're going to follow Jesus' example. And we're going to break a big problem into small parts. And we're going to fix it. Okay, we're going to break it down. We're going to lift it up. And by God's grace, we're going to give it up. Jesus is the bread of life. Could you stand to your feet?